HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Today's program is brought to you by Tabard Inn, new American cuisine in one of Washington, D.C.'s oldest hotels, located in DuPont Circle. For more information, visit tabardinn.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Welcome to the Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Katie Morton, wine director at Marta and the newly opened Vine Frite, part of Danny Myers Union Square Hospitality Group. We'll talk to Katie about bubbles, pizza, her new restaurant, and more. We'll taste the sparkling Blanc de Blanc from Trentino, Italy for our weekly wine sip. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for the Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Katie Morton was once a student of dance, but is now an expert in wine. Katie was voted one of the best new sommeliers of 2017 by Wine and Spirits magazine. She attended the Culinary Institute of America thinking she wanted to cook but danced her way through 11 Madison Park as a runner, then as part of their wine team, and moved on to the opening staff at the Nomad. Katie spent over two years at Union Square Hospitality Group's Mayolino, eventually moving on to become the wine director at Marta, and now the new, newly opened Vine Frite. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thanks for having me, Sam. Nice to have you here. I want to give our audience a little background on who you are. So tell us a little about your journey in life, wine, and restaurants that got you currently to Marta and now, excitingly, Vine Frite. Yeah, well, it's a really great question. So I started dancing at a very young age. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, when I was five and uh, grew up on a really small island in the middle of the Puget Sound called Bainbridge Island. Wow. Um, and the Northwest at that time and still today I find is a true sort of hotbed of a really amazing food, blackberries, salmon, oysters, things like that. As you know, um, a lot of the East Coast wineries were just, east, uh, Eastern, Eastern Washington wineries were just being developed right. at that time. So we saw a lot of orchards um, actually becoming vineyards. Um, and so Charles Smith actually owned a... Uh, uh, Is that the crazy white-haired guy? Exactly. He, right. he's, a, he's a big dude in the Washington wine world, right. and, and he really inspired me. Uh, my parents were in love with food, and so I decided not to become a dancer, but to do something else really easy instead, which is become a chef. Okay. Uh, and uh, went to culinary school. In New York? In New not York. Not the one in uh, Napa. So right. you went across the country. 
went across the country, okay. packed my bags, took the metronome for the very first time in my life, okay. and to uh, popped down the other side of Poughkeepsie. Right. Uh, and uh, kind of a, you know, Dorothy's not in Kansas anymore moment for me, um, which was truly awesome. And I think really, really shaped who I am today. And I was there for about four years. Um, you were at CIA for four years? Four years. You got up every morning, put your toque on and your white jacket and your striped pants? <laughs> yes. Wow. Exactly. And uh, the second year is great because you, you have a lot of opportunity uh, to learn about beverage, too, and about managing a restaurant. And I realized having come back uh, from what we call an externship, which is where you get to be intensive and work in a restaurant while you're still going to school for a couple months and... Um, I loved it and I loved restaurants, but I knew that chefs, that being a chef wasn't the right direction, wasn't where I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be connecting with people. This is year two or a little later? Year two. Okay. Mm -hmm. So halfway through it, you kind of figured it out. Figured it out. The light bulb went off in my head and I was like, wine is definitely my thing. And it was in fact, actually over a glass of bubbles that I found over a comp to champagne that I found that, that wine was the thing. Um, and I was really excited about it, and I was really excited about the history and all that it had to offer. And I thought, hmm, this could be a thing. And, uh, you know, really wanted to work for Danny Meyer. And So, but you said you were there for four years, so you had two ahead of you. You changed your course at that point? Yeah, so it's just one. Uh, it's a bachelor in culinary arts management. Okay. And there's no real specifications after that. Everyone just takes all the same classes, which is amazing. So everyone's kind of on board. Everyone knows each other. Everyone is competing for the exact same thing. Um, and and you, you go on and do what you want. Exactly. And you exactly. have figured it out midway through. Mm -hmm. So you finish there, and your aspirations are, was it Danny Meyer? Really, to work for Danny Meyer. Really? Well, uh, you didn't, but you didn't do bad. So what happened? Yeah, so... Uh, it was the coldest day in February, and I put on a suit. I took the Metro North to New York, and uh, I was in this giant, giant jacket, and it was like one of those really super cold days in February, and I had all my stacks of printed resume and really just hounded the streets from restaurant to restaurant to really? restaurant, uh, handing my, because I thought it was really important to hand my resume in person, uh, and what do you know it on the, on the train ride back, 11 Madison park calls me back. Wow. Same day. Asked me to come in for an interview. And I know cause I, I pitched it that you started as a runner there. Right. You spoke to all these places to get in pretty much at any level, right? Exactly. I mean, you didn't think you were going to be a sommelier right away, did you? No, not okay. at all. So yeah, and I think that's kind of what dancing teaches you, right? Like, you have to work your way up. Like, right. you're not going to be prima ballerina from exactly. day one. So. so you get the call. Get the call. Ask me to come in for an interview, which I do. Um, and they hire me right off the bat. So I'm really... It's amazing. It's truly incredible. How many people do you think you dropped your resume off to? Every single restaurant. So dozens? Every single, well, every single restaurant in Danny Meyer's organization at okay. that time um, is who I sent resumes to. I forgot. That was a Danny Meyer restaurant then. Right. That's why I said, yeah, I have to <laughs> clarify that. Um, all right. So you start right away? Right away. Um, it's, a, it's my first introduction to uh, being in the adult world. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, being a kitchen server at 11 Madison Park, which was probably one of the, the funnest restaurant jobs I've ever had. Um, and uh, at the time... Tell people what a runner is or, you know, a kitchen yeah. server. So it's, um, you know, in fine dining restaurants there, it's highly segmented, right? And I'm sure uh, if you've seen it, you notice that there's a lot of people on the floor at once. There's someone pouring water in your glass, there's someone crumbing your table, there's someone greeting you, and everyone has their own individual job. And as a food runner, your job is literally just to bring the food from the kitchen. Waiter takes the order, you bring serve. Exactly. Right. And, and you bring all the food. And, and what's great in fine dining and what's great, what you really need to be great at as a kitchen, as a kitchen runner or a food runner is uh, tray service. And so you learn all these awesome, like, old-school French, you know, 
terms and old school ways of serving people that are really, you don't see that much anymore unless you go to Danielle or right. the modern or it's kind of a Bernadette. lost art yeah. in a way. So you do that for how long? I did that for about eight months. Uh, That's not a long time. So how do you work your way to the wine world there? Yeah, well... Did you was, tell them in your interview you had interest in wine? I remember. I didn't tell them in my interview, but I do remember telling Will Gadara that I was... That I remember... Well, I remember, A, talking to my mom on the phone and being like, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to tell Will what I'm into. And I told Will, we, you sit down kind of 30 days into when you start it at 11 Madison Park and you have an exchange of, this is what I want to do, this is what I'm into. And I, I kind of let Will know that, that wine and being a part of the wine team was really interesting to me. And he said, how is your relationship with John Reagan? And John I was said, the wine guy there. Exactly, the wine director at the time. And I said, no, not, not very good yet. <laughs> He's like, well, why don't you go talk to John Reagan? So I went and pounded on the cellar door, and John must have been doing some kind of inventory in the cellar, and I was sort of a whirlwind into the cellar and and I remember being like John I want to be a master sommelier and I want to be a sommelier at 11 Madison Park with all the intent and excitement of the world and of a like a young bright-eyed bushy tail like a youthful person in the food world in the food industry and um he was like okay okay yes so yeah calm down (laughs) we've got a couple more things you can do before you do that and I just remember him you know doing a really great thing for me which is not giving all the cards away and saying why don't you try to do a couple of these things, read a couple of these books, talk to a couple of people, and we'll see where that leads us. In the end, real good advice. Exactly. You know, slow, patient, steady. Mm-hmm. So you do that. Do that, and... Uh, How much time transpires till... Oh, man. It was probably six months or so. Oh, really? I did really early on. That's what I wanted to do, but I once I set my mind to something like that... I, of course, then took the intro exam, passed, then took the certified exam, passed, and was about ready to become a sommelier somewhere else. And then uh, Will came to me and offered me to be an assistant sommelier at 11 Madison Park, and I did that for a couple months and then was promoted fully to sommelier at 11 Madison Park. So. How many psalms there was a wine director? How many psalms were on the floor? Mm, there you talked about service, so for wine they had... Three, four people? Exactly. Four, four other sommeliers at the time right. working the floor and um, just really, really inspiring people. Uh, Chase Dubay, who I'm still really good friends with, he's a great guy and just really powerhouse, knowledgeable, amazing, amazing So you people. do that for how long? You do the wine service for how long? For at 11 at Madison. At 11. At 11 Madison Park, I did that for about a year. Okay. And then... Will came to me again and said, I'm opening up this new concept and I really want you to be a part of it um, on the opening team. And I said, great, let's that, do that's it. That's exciting, right? Yeah, let's ride that. What, did they open it with Thomas or he came? Yeah. So you were part of that crew. Right. And How do you pronounce Thomas's last name? Pastorchek. Pastorchek, right. Yes. Thomas and Dustin Wilson are coming on to promote the Reboule de Rhone in a few oh, weeks. Oh, that's so great. So, so you go, <coughs> excuse me, you go to Nomad, which a lot of buzz, exciting, the Will Gudera, Daniel Hum team. So exciting. And really pushing that envelope between that what they called an intersection of Uptown, a perfect intersection between Uptown and Downtown. Right. And it truly became that restaurant. And it was so exciting because it was one of the first fine dining restaurants I had been in. Fine dining, high and casual, however you want to put it, that was playing... Rolling Stones and Hollow right. Notes right. in the dining room. That, that wasn't happening at 11 Madison. No, it wasn't. Right. So it had the chops for food and wine, but mm-hmm. it had, you know, a, a cooler vibe. All right, so you do that for how long? Two years. You were there for two years. Mm-hmm. Um, after two years, you decide what? Yeah, I decide that, I, I, that there's something missing, and there's something missing called Italian wine. What um, compelled you to think Italian wine was missing? Something you always loved? It was uh, an idea that you're you're only as good as your weakest. So you wanted to pursue the weakness. I did. Okay. Um, and it just so happened to be that at the time, uh, Maialino was looking to hire sommeliers, which was not something that happened 
when that restaurant opened. So when it opened in 2010, it literally had tumblers as wine glasses and, you know, a two-page list, which was awesome because that was the style of that restaurant. It was a Roman trattoria. But since then, it had really changed. So honestly, someone reached out to me and was like, Miley knows hiring sommeliers. I was like, what? You know, Sounded right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I met with Jeff Kellogg at the time and he was really great and super inspiring and, and we just kind of really got along and I thought, why not? This sounds like a great idea. I sure, I sure will miss selling Burgundy, but right. uh, Italy Left is also Left on good really terms ex- with, the, with Will and those guys? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's always been a really wonderfully dynamic, close relationship between he and Danny and right. in that organization. So you do Maialino, which is hardcore Italian food and wine. You get your dose, finally, of Italian wine. Right. You're there over two years, right? Right. And then you move on Mm -hmm. to where and why. Yeah. So currently now I'm at a restaurant called Marta. We're up to now. Up to now. So Marta's part of the Union Square Hospitality Group. Um, We'll talk about Marta. You know, I want to get a little more into it. So you go to Marta. You're at Marta. How long? It's been a year now. Okay. And then an interesting thing happens, which is... This new restaurant, a new bar. That just opened a week ago. That's part of your group called? Vini e Fritti. Okay, we're going to talk about that. All right, so that's that's Katie in a nutshell, okay? All right, so I want to talk to you about a bunch of things. We'll talk about Marta. We'll talk about Vini. Um, but I can't let you sit here without talking about the world's greatest food, and that's pizza. Yeah. Okay? So... Katie Morton, who we're talking to, is the wine director at Marta and the newly opened Vine Frite. And you're literally surrounded by pizza. (laughs) Okay, fair to say? So let's tell our listeners, because you're as qualified as, what are the best wines to drink with pizza? Because everyone eats pizza. It's a great, great question, Sam. A lot of different things, but... Uh, you got to narrow it down a little. And, and there's some interesting takes on this. And yeah. bring those in. Well, uh, Marta is known for uh, pioneering what has now been called the Marta effect. Which, which is? just refers to the idea that champagne is the best thing to consume while eating pizza. Okay, so our first answer is one of the great wines for pizza is champagne. Champagne. I agree. And this is because, right, pizza is a rich, doughy, bready style oily. of food. Oily. Right. And champagne is crisp and refreshing and has bubbles in it and is therefore delicious with pizza. Perfect foil for that. Yeah. Okay, I was hoping you would say that first. And we're going to talk a little more about champagne. Now, <laughs> let's go wine. Yeah. Tell me some good wines to pair yeah. with pizza. Well, uh, champagne's wine, but let's go non-sparkling. As far as non-sparkling goes, uh, right now one of my favorite wines to drink with pizza is Nebbiolo. Okay. And uh, Nebbiolo is a grape from the Piedmont section of Italy. And what are some of the wines that you like? I've been really into this region um, that's in Piemonte, that's more north, that's literally in the mountains, tucked into the mountains, Alpine region. So It's called Alpine region? It's called Alto Piemonte. Okay, Alto Piemonte. But the nice thing is we've had other guests mention that, so obviously oh, great. it's hot in a good way, and they're turning out some good stuff. So Alto Piemonte, north of Piedmont, Mm-hmm. So tell me what's going on up there. What what should we look for? Or what are they famous for? There's this young gentleman named Cristiano Gorella. Spell um, Gorella. 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 Oh man. G a r e l l a. There that you type go. Of thing? Yeah, okay. Sam, you're much better at spelling than I am. All right. Um, and he is, I don't know, thirty, thirty-two, and I had the opportunity to meet him in July, and he is an incredibly industrious young gentleman who is corralling all these. Producers in the Alto Piemonte who have been there for years, um, older gentlemen, older men and women, um, who are very particular about the way they make wine. Um, Is he like a negotiant? or 
A little bit. Okay. But also a, a consultant, if you will. All right. And he's saying, hey, guys, we all have to get together and, like, bring this region up and get people to know about this region because these wines are amazing. And it's absolutely incredible how he can tell, as a young person, all these people who have been doing this for years what to do. Wow. And um, I find him really inspiring. And he's really had an effect. And he's had an effect and a great effect on the wines and the producers to introduce him in the market and to kind of bring that connection to the to United States and Piedmont. So are the wines Gorilla Wines? He he makes them under his name? He does make some wines under his okay. name, but he also consults for many other wineries okay. too as well. Give me a non you know, not his wine. Is there another maker that you have yeah, your eye? There's a great winery, um, well, it's relatively accessible called Cantalupo. Okay. That I think is awesome. And um, their entry level wines are really bright and fresh and super pretty. Um, so, bright, fresh, super pretty goes well with pizza? Absolutely, okay. it does. Yeah. And we have this great pizza on the menu at Marta called the Matcha Lyo. That means the butcher in Italian. And it's got all the meats on it guanciale, wow. which is, you know, pork chow, kind of similar to bacon and. So prosciutto, which is like, you know, a fancier version of pepperoni. Right. And you get Spicy. those. Exactly. Right. Um, all right. So those are good ones. Let's, I want to go back. Well, let me ask you one thing about Nebbiolo. What about like baby Nebbiolos, mm -hmm. like Lange and all that? I mean, are those exciting to you? Extremely exciting Tell to me. Tell people what those are. I mean, they're value-driven Nebbiolos. Right. Um, different expressions of Nebbiolo uh, that I think are intended sort of for different purposes as well. And I think if Barolo and Barbaresco is the wine that you drink on Sundays, you know, with your grand Sunday uh, lunch or brunch and, you know, that Longue and, um, you know, maybe some examples, some Nebbiolo examples from the Rarero, from Sandy or Soil, or sort of daily drinking Nebbiolos, uh, more accessible and, and but, honestly... But very good, right? Very good and yeah. great in their youth, which is great for for the wine culture that we have, which is like, let's just drink now. Let's right. not wait. Let's have this now. Right. So today on a Lange or a Rarero, is that mm -hmm. how you say it? You would drink what vintage year would you be drinking? A 14, a 15? Right now we're drinking a uh, Ruanya Lange, uh, 2011, which I think okay. is pretty delicious. So there's some age to it, but not like Barolo and Barbaresco, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. All right, so let's go back to Champagne because we just recommended some good wines for pizza, um, Al uh, Alto Pamonte. Now, I want to tap further into your expertise. Tell me about some exciting champagnes and growers that we should be looking for. And I think you're great to answer because you have such a range on your list, pricing-wise. Mm -hmm. So tell me some good stuff to look for. Yeah. Are you a grower champagne advocate? or? Yeah, I... Um... I think I'm a champagne advocate first, right. yeah. More importantly, right. Uh, I think that what's happening on the grower level, as you say, or as someone who has their own grapes and makes wine solely from the grapes that they grow. Right. That's the difference between grower and a big corporate champagne company. Exactly, exactly. I think that um, those are they're fascinating to me because we've seen a, a real movement in the last uh, you know, 10 years or so um, where younger people are buying back their land um, and they're making wine Very cool. as a grower. And, and I think that it's always interesting to see what someone's doing when they're new on the scene. And they're learning from the masters, and masters like Jacques Salos makes great wine, and they're taking a page from people who are great producers and have been great producers and saying, great, I see you, that's great. And they're making their own interpretations of what their wine should be based on some really amazing things that people have found out in the past. So that means the production's a little more limited. They're not heavy, heavy production because it's sort of a state grown, right? Exactly. You know, it's their grapes. 
Give me a couple of faves or recommendations that are somewhat accessible. I know yeah. you can get stuff that we can't, but tell me stuff that... Sure. Um, Chartan Taille is a, is a great accessible So champagne. Chartan, C-H-A-R-T-O-N. What was the second? Taille is T-A-I-L-L-E. Right. Talit. Taille. Talit, yes. Okay. Chartan Talit. Um, and Alexandra learned from Jack Solos, so he's one of the people I and mentioned. Solos is one of the most highly regarded Extremely. champagne makers. All right, so that's a good one. Give me one more. And I'm sure he has a few different, you mm-hmm. know, champagne. What kind of price yeah. range are we talking retail? Honestly, 65 wow. maybe, yeah. And uh, Frederic Savart is also uh, someone who I really uh, think is doing amazing, amazing things too, as well as, as another another person who's taking a page uh you know is the second generation who is who is making great waves in the champagne world and really trying to hone in and understand which grapes belong on which soil and right. all these amazing sort of high Very level things with all of that. yes it's not just growing and bottling it's it's the whole process yes um so that's savart s-a-v-a-r-t similar price range very similar yeah okay so those are two good ones, but really, if you want to sample, and you do buy the glass and bottle for champagne, right? Yeah, we have Savart by the glass right now, actually. You go into Marta or Vina Frite, which we'll talk about. Before we talk about that, I just want to ask you this, and I think I know the answer. So you had to pick between Sangiovese from Tuscany or Nebbiolo from the Piedmont section. Do you have a personal favorite? I would have it's, thought Piedmont, but you, it, it you, is, you sighed for a second. It is. I sighed for a second because it's something that people, it's something that sommeliers ask each other all the time. They do. And it's something that people who love Italian wine ask each other all the time. And uh, Neviolo is, can be very transformative and, and, and incredible. And, and I will say that I love Nebbiolo, but I don't know. It's really difficult for me to leave Sangiovese out of the mix because... What Sangioveses do you love? Is it Brunello? I mean, what... I mean, honestly, I mean, the, you know, Barolo and Barbaresco are so incredibly prestigious, but I mean, if you're going to talk about what I find exciting is some things that are happening right now in Chianti and, you know, with Sangiovese, and I think there's a lot of... There's has been some missteps in the past, and there's been some Be really specific. great things. So there's exciting, exciting stuff in Chianti. Like what? Yeah, I think Matriponi is a great producer. Um, Montanadoli is really great. She's incredible. And Are it, these fairly new people in the? Not new, okay. but just making some very good wines. Making some great wines, and and we're starting to pay attention a little bit more. Nice. Mm-hmm. So. Both great. Not going to ask you to pick your favorite kid. Love them both, right? Love them both. Okay. Fair enough. All right, let's talk a little about the restaurants. So tell me a little more about Marta and the wine list. The food, give me the quick description. You walk into Marta and here's what you're getting food and wine-wise. Yeah. Well, in Marta we have uh, two pizza ovens. Right. And we... What style of pizza? Pizza is Roman. It's Roman. So there's different styles, right? There sure are. Okay. Yeah. And this what is, is Roman pizza? Yeah, this is thin cracker crust pizza, whereas uh, pizza from Napoli is a little softer right. in style. Uh, right. So I know Danny when he was younger went to Rome a lot, so I'm sure it was his vision to have a Roman trattoria pizzeria. Yeah. So the highlight are these Roman pizzas, mm-hmm. and what other kind of foods? So we have no gas in the kitchen at all, wow. just the pizza ovens and the wood-fired grill. Mm. So, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So uh, the chefs there do really, Joe Tarasco, who's now running um, the kitchen there, is doing some amazing stuff on the grill, beer brine chicken, mm. and every you know ember-roasted beets, mm. ember-roasted sweet potatoes. Everything has a little bit of that Char. char going yeah. on and it's wonderfully exciting to pair wine with so what do we pair with so the wine list skews bubbles right yes and the other strength is what italian or italian yes only is it italian? almost it is only italian besides the bubbles exactly what we talked about sangiovese and nebbiolo what 
areas are the most prominently featured? Yeah, those. Those? Yes, but then also Alianico because... That is, tell people where... Alianico is the grape? Alianico is the grape. It's pronounced Aglianico, L-I-A-N-C-O, mm-hmm. and it's from where? It's from Campania. Okay, which is an island in Italy or... Which is on the western coast of Italy. It's on the western coast. Right? Central. Sicily's the island. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. There and they're go. making some great wines, and that's the indigenous grape? It sure is. Okay. And it pairs well with your food? It's all volcanic soil, so the wines tend to be very smoky. And so wines with volcanic soils, the characteristic is smoky? Mm-hmm. And that goes well with? Charred. Charred, smoky food. All right, give me one more. That's a good one. Campania and Aglianico. Yeah, sure. Sicily, speaking of volcanic soil. Mount Etna. Mount Etna is great and also doing some really exciting things. Uh, Giolama Russo, um, you know, uh, Pasapicharo, there's all these. Right. Salvo Foti, there's. I'll, I'll post some of those on our site because mm-hmm. I think if you go there, you could taste them, but if you're going to be outside you could look for them um so those those are some great choices let's talk about vine frite Mm. which just opened you told me a week ago tell me how that came about what it is the wine interesting take yeah so danny was really excited about this restaurant in london called dogs and bubbles which are all hot dogs and champagne and Um, we had an opportunity, an extra space inside uh, the hotel that Marta is located in on the 30th Street side um, between Park and Madison. And, uh, you know, Danny, as you said, has a long history with Rome and, and really has a huge connection with that food. And Fried food in Rome is a huge thing. Romans love fried That's snacks. the frite and the vini frite. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's so a snack type thing more? Snacks. Arancini, okay. sucoli, uh, carciofini, fritti, which is fried artichokes, baby artichokes, and love everything that. you could ever want right. in, in your fried food. So what? So it's sort of a limited menu. It's sort of a Roman snack bar. Um, I want to ask you about the wines in a second, but I think one of the other offerings is it's an aperitivo bar and you serve ABV drinks, which I heard of but don't know much about. So what are aperitivos? And tell me what ABV drinks are, which yeah. you'll get when you get in there, right? Right. So uh, as we say, TV culture is very strong in Italy, and TV is something that you drink before you go to dinner with a little snack, Um, And obviously, if you're drinking drinks before dinner, and in Italy, right, you probably start drinking around 7 or so, and then maybe you have dinner by 9, you want to make sure that whatever you're drinking, you're going to also be able to make it to dinner later on. Right. So ABV is alcohol by volume. Which means lower alcohol? Lower alcohol. So you could drink more and not get as buzzed. So you can go all day? You can go all day. I bet you a lot of our listeners didn't know what an ABV is. <laughs> yes. And I don't think anybody would push back on it. <laughs> so if you're out all day, you know, go to Vini Frite or another bar and say, give me some ABV drinks and all that. And are aperitivos, are they characterized as like Aperol or Campari spritz type stuff? Or is it a more general category? Yeah, it's a more general category. Okay. There are definitely, as you mentioned, Really famous Those Campari, of- Aperol are, are some of the most recognizable. Capaletti is very similar to Campari, but is sort of newer on the scene, but is in that same. Capaletti is the brand. Yes. And it's a good aperitivo. Very good aperitivo. Slam a few of those down. You won't be too crazy. That's what you're talking about? <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, so the wine list at Vini Frite is, how'd you design that? Because you designed it. Right, so it's a selection of uh, 40 sparkling wines by the bottle, and then uh, five sparkling glasses by the glass, and then uh, three whites, still whites, and three reds. Um, And what our main goal when we were thinking about designing that list was that it's going to be a bar, and 
in a bar, most of the time you ask for suggestions, but you mostly pioneer the list or the cocktail list on your own and you make your own decisions. So what I wanted to do was to make champagne more accessible to people who were looking to order by the bottle on the list. So we separated it into four different categories, light, medium, richer, and rosé. Those those are just the champagnes, or those are all the sparkling wines, including non-champagne? Champagne and sparkling wines from Italy. All right, so we talked about champagne. Talk to me about exciting sparkling wines. Is Lambrusco in the game? Oh, my gosh, absolutely. Lambrusco is a red sparkling. Tell me what Lambrusco is. Yeah, Lambrusco is a, a red sparkling wine, right? And Is it the same grape, or does it vary by vintner? It depends, yeah. Um, What I've seen most of all that I'm in love with is that lighter style of Lambrusco that's really come on the scene. Like a Um, rosé Lambrusco? Almost like a rosé Lambrusco, yeah. Do you have a maker for me? I mean, can you recommend? Yeah, Cleto Chiarli. Spell? C-L-E-T-O and C-H-I-A-R-L-I. Chiarli. Chiarli for you. A very fun wine for pizza and fried snacks, right? Yes. Then you have Prosecco which is a sparkling wine with a little added sugar. Uh Uh-huh. And is there another thing out there? There's an extraordinary amount of of sparkling wine styles. There's sparkling wine made in in Piedmont. Right. We're going to taste something from Trentino from the Alto Adige. Right. So there's many sparkling wines, and I guess the best way to sample them is to come in and look on your list. Yeah. Because that's the specialty. Great. All right, so Katie, we're gonna we're talking to Katie Morton. We're gonna take a quick break because we have to. When we come back, I have a few more questions, and I want to subject you to our wine list. I want to get a take on what you're drinking. So we're talking to Katie Morton from Marta and the newly opened Vina Frite. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Grape Nation. The following program has been brought to you by Tabard Inn. Tabard Inn, Washington, D.C.'s quintessential small hotel, is located on a quiet, tree-lined street just five blocks from the White House. Vibrant yet unassuming, the Tabard is comprised of 40 sleeping rooms, each unique in character and design. Feast on eclectic American cuisine in their acclaimed restaurant, or enjoy a cocktail and listen to live jazz in one of their cozy Victorian seating areas. Mingle with travelers from around the world who find the Tabard the only place to stay when taking their travels to Washington. For more information, visit tabardin.com. All right, we're back. We're back with my guest, Katie Morton, from Marta and the newly opened Vina Frite. A um, couple more questions, Katie, and then I want to ask you questions on our wine list. Um, your company and your boss, Danny Meyer, and Union Square Hospitality, they seem to get it right every time. I mean, you've been there a while. Why is that? What do they do? I mean, they are special. Why are they special? Collaboration is the biggest part for me about making restaurants successful. And when you take experiences that Danny Meyer has had personally in Rome and also collectively he takes people on his team to Rome as well to experience the same things that they come back with a wealth of knowledge and also a sense of collaboration because they have experienced restaurants other places they take ideas from different things and they're not afraid to say hey that other person had a better I- idea than I did so Danny encourages that yeah let's let's take it's a page like, here's my book. concept here's how we're doing it it's collaboration and experience it's a collaboration he does a phenomenal job sort of steering the boat in a really great direction and when you get a little off course he might make a little suggestion about how to improve something or how to tweak something he probably knows um i i, I agree with that um it is truly one of the great um restaurant groups and it is led by a visionary um, before we get into the wine list, I forgot to ask you, because we talk so much about champagne. What's the best way to drink champagne, glass and temperature-wise? Mm-hmm. If you can control that, what do you do? I mean, what, yeah. do you use a champagne flute? Do you use something else? Is it ice cold? Is it room temperature? You tell me. Well, I think drinking wine, number one, should be whatever feels 
whatever feels right, whatever feels best to you. That should be rule number one. Okay. Whatever, however you like it is how you should do it. Okay. Because it's wine. I love that. Right. Right. It's wine and it's for you to enjoy and um, for the people you're experiencing with. But if I were to give an opinion on how um, or the way that I like to drink it is I like a smaller white wine glass. And smaller white wine glass, got mm-hmm. you. And so something a little, a little bit bigger than the flute, a little bit more of a bold glass, got not you. something too big, um, but just something that you could be able to smell the wine a little bit more. Right, open than just it up more. That small opening that a flute provides you. I think that's the best way to experience. So a small white wine glass, not too cold. Uh, some yeah. nice chill to it. Some I, I like it room temperature because I think the flavors come out. Right. All right, so that's the best way to, in Katie's estimation, to try wine. Now, Katie, I'm going to subject you to a few questions. Let's buzz through them quickly, Um, and then we want to taste the wine that you brought in. What are you drinking now? What are you experimenting, tasting, you know, now? Could be seasonal, could be something you want to put in the restaurant. Not yesterday, not next week. Yeah, well, I usually drink a lot of Nebbiolo. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I drink, I, we hate to say it again, but Alto di Monte. And okay. So that's, that's, really that's what's going on with you. You're really drinking through it. So Nebbiolo from uh, Piedmont and Barbaresco and Alto Pamonte, which is north of that region. Good answer. And, and we of gave course you champagne. And champagne. Your Katie Morton's favorite wine and food pairing. Something you've had. More than a few times when it you It was had... actually here at, um, oh my gosh, at Blanca. Blanca? Yeah, and I had... Which is the uh, tasting restaurant to Roberta's where we broadcast. Yeah, and... my favorite pairing in the world was this beef consomme. Okay. Um, that has had like notes of soy in it and really thinly sliced, almost just gently cooked beef with a glass of Oloroso sherry. That's a good match. It's almost like a umami shabu and, and sherry, which really is a little different. <laughs> Nobody's ever said that on the show. I mean, I get fried chicken and pizza, exactly. oysters and champagne. Y- y- you got that one. All right. Besides Union Square Hospitality in your places, give me your favorite wine restaurant and or bar that the selection's good, the people's good, the vibe's good, the wine service... Yeah, I would say what what Caleb Gainzer is doing at a company, company. Okay, is really fun. That that's a good example of wine service, uh, food. Anything else? Um, no. I mean that's okay. that's, that's kind that's, of I don't need to that. And then I mean I love I I think that diner is always a great place to in kind Brooklyn. Of, yeah, to to <laughs> try new things. One. They always have rotating. Wines by the glass that are that are great Very and interesting and diner in Brooklyn. Katie Morton's favorite all time wine. Wow. One, two. That would have to be uh, sixty seven Bartolo Mascarello. Mascarello mm-hmm. Bartolo sixty seven mm-hmm. Italian Barolo. Barolo. Yes. Okay, and where did you have that? I had that at Milino. Okay. <laughs> And that was like, oh wow, beyond. Yeah, it was a, it was a. Well, actually, I mean, there are a couple of different wines that did this for me, but I was total, I was total French wine snob, despite the fact that I wanted to learn about Italian wine, and I had really yet to be proven, or had to prove to myself that Italian wine was something that was on par with French wine, and uh, that was kind of the the shift that I. Causing me to not be such a snob. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, we have one last question, but I just wanted to tell you, Katie, and our audience, we're going to be talking to Patrick Cappiello in a few minutes. He's going to talk about a great fundraising uh, event that he's putting together. He's going to call in, and that's going to be in a few minutes. But we have another question, and Katie and I have to take a taste a little wine. All right, so I think you'd be great at this. I ask everyone, best wine around 15 bucks retail, 15-ish. Not down, up. Mm-hmm. Give me a red, give me a white. You can give me a region, you can give me makers, both. Yeah, Muscadet, hands down. Muscadet for, for the white. For white wine. And there's there's like Pepier. Give me a couple of... Uh, yeah, 
Pepier is perfect. Who um, else? Give me one Domaine more. de Q is really good. L apostrophe yes, ECU. ECU. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, and then as far as red wine goes, I mean, Beaujolais would have to be, you know, Dutrave. I mean, it's probably a little too expensive. It's probably beyond the fiend. D-U-T-R-A-I-V-E. Dutrave mm-hmm. Beaujolais, mm-hmm. which is part of Burgundy. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. It may be a few bucks. Give me something good, a little cheaper. Oh, man. That's, I mean, I think that for Pato is a really great okay. grape that you can get for super reasonable. Okay. Mm-hmm. You said Frappato? Frappato, yeah. Okay. And that's Italian made. Sicily. Sic- the mm-hmm. Frappato's the grape. Frappato's the grape. It's made in Sicily and you could pick up some. And what's the characteristic? It's like, it's like a peppery, more peppery version of Pinot Noir. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, it's a good food wine. All right, so those are Katie's choices. I'm going to post those on our social media, Facebook and all of that, so you could uh, seek them out. Um, Vitor, my engineer, is reaching out to Patrick. We'll talk to him in a minute. But, Katie, every week we taste a different wine on air. For our weekly wine sip this week, I asked Katie to bring in a wine that she handpicked, and, of course, she brought in a sparkling wine. She brought in a Marco Zani Blanc de Blanc sparkling wine from Trentino, Italy, which is the Alto Adige region of Italy. Um, it's a selection Masali wine. Give me an idea of cost, retail, and availability. Yeah, it's definitely available in... in okay, so you could find it. And what would it cost? I don't know, 25 probably. Okay, good yeah. price. Um, and this is a no dosage method Champenois Italian sparkling wine. Tell me a little about the maker. Right, so he got the vineyards from his father, and uh, it's an old estate. Um, He bought them in in 1988, is when this winery was established. And um, I I found it so interesting because it is Chardonnay, it is limestone soil, he calls it Blanc de Blanc, it is Champagne Method and honestly... I, it was Danny who caused me to do this, who was like, great. I mean, we know you love champagne, but can you give Italy a little bit of a sparkling wine, nice. you know, rundown? And so this was one of the wines I found that I that I was really fascinated by because I think... I think he's a natural winemaker too, right? He, he yeah. is, which is... Which is oh, kind of cool. Is very cool and, and definitely uh, on trend, as they say. Right. Um, Pretty much. But, All right, so let's... Um, We have a couple minutes, and then we'll jump on the phone with Patrick. Let's, so color, it's sort of that traditional pale yellow, not too dark, not too light. Um, Talk to me about the nose. What do you get? It's very champagne-y. It's not like an Italian sparkling wine. I mean, I know that's kind of a base description, but... No, I I think that's a perfect description because they're, because champagne method is what makes champagne, right? right? And it's... It's what hap- it's what's happening in that bottle, um, you know, during that period of time in which twice s- fermented like champ, which is method champagne. All right, so mouthfeel. Let's throw it over the tongue. You describe champagne, bubbly, bubbly. fine bubbles. Yeah, there's Good a medium. Medium. There's a little bit of a creaminess to it, but then what I love about the finish is that it's all mineral for mm. me yeah and i get that limestone all right palette palette the minerality i know you described exactly. a little of that there's yeah, from the limestone like, what fruits or what else do you pick up yeah on? like golden apple and apple. um i also get fresh herbs sage mm. i get apples like and sage on the nose mm-hmm. and on the palate. there's that herby sagey thing yep exactly all right what foods would you pair this with Pizza. Okay. Yes. Give me a second choice. <laughs> um, I think that uh, if we're going to talk healthy, um, there's a great... Uh, we uh, haven't all day. So right. There's well. a great salad on, on Marta's menu right now that's a little bit of Piave Vecchia, which is um, a white cheese, soft white cheese, nice. a little nutty. Um, is that one or two words? Piave Vecchio? Two words, two yeah. Two words, okay. Faro. Um, Farrow the grain. Honey crisp apples and then mm. shaved raw Brussels sprouts. Mm. This would go nice with that. Um, so I always ask, do we like this wine? I know you like it because you brought it in. <laughs> and I think it's a pretty impressive Italian sparkler. That's the Marco Zani Blanc de Blanc. 
it's a non-vintage, right? Right. Of course, sparkling wine from Trentino. Um, it's pretty much available, so look out for it. I'll post it on our site, too. So we both like this wine. Um, Vitor, can we now talk to uh, Patrick Capiello? Sam. Hey, how are you? Good. Um, hey, Katie. We're hey. on the air That's live. Funny. I was just going to say say hello to Katie. You beat me to the I, punch. I, I, I've, been, I've been listening in. Okay. Oh, you guys thanks. are doing great. Awesome. Um, You're making me thirsty just listening to you. Yeah. <laughs> Go out and get a Modelo and leave me alone. Um, I... I was scanning Instagram and something popped up and it was a fundraising event to help uh, out in California. The fires, you know, all the winemakers and wine people. And I saw that you were behind it. So I reached out to you and I thought it would be a good idea for you to jump on the air and tell us exactly, you know, what, when, what's going on. For sure. I mean, I appreciate it, Sam. Thanks so much for giving me a minute to talk about it. Yeah, so the, the foundation that my, myself and Pax Malley and Sarah Morgan Stern, um, two, two winemakers, a winemaker and a sommelier from California, uh, we, we put together really quickly, actually over the course of a weekend, uh, a charity that, that is focused primarily and, and entirely actually on raising money for victims of the wildfires that are in, working in the wine industry. So this, is, this isn't money that's going to... You know, people who own wineries, this is like to the people who work in wineries, the people who live in Santa Rosa, right. people who, you know, work in the vineyards. People, people that need it the most. Down. People who need the money, who don't, who don't have insurance policies on their, on their big fancy wineries, you know what I mean? This is like, it's like people, people who, are, who are in desperate need and, and are in need now. And so uh, Pax and I and Sarah got together. Uh, I was there, actually, in California during the wildfires. I got trapped in Mendocino um, after running from the fire. I was, I was at Scribe Winery, and um, the fire coming in the middle of the night. We had to, we had to evacuate. It was... An amazing and terrifying experience, and it really kind of you know struck me in a way that I've never really. And I've been through a lot of disasters. I lived, I lived in New York in 2001. I've, I've seen a lot of terrible things, and and you know this is something that just struck me so much because I realized when I got home and I turned on the news that nobody gave a fuck about it. People were more concerned about Harvey Weinstein or Donald Trump or right. all this other bullshit, and nobody realized there was something <laughs> tragic happening in in the West Coast and the people that we care about. And so I, I just made up my mind that I was going to try and do whatever I could do to to, to help. So thankfully, Pax and, and Sarah got on board, and we, and we we organized something. It's called the Winemakers and Sommeliers for California Wildlife Relief, Wildfire Relief Party. All right. So the uh, first for, thing for, is, if people want more information, where do they go? And then we'll talk about. They the go event. to our, our our website, which is it's it's a, it's a little gnarly, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead. We'll take it best. slow. It's 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 W S C W R dot com, and that's, that's the, the maybe people in some ways right. for wild for wildfire California wildfire relief. Yeah, dot com. Right? Okay, dot com. Correct. Yeah. And so what do you do there? You, all the list of events that we're doing now. We're doing three events now. There's one in New York um, uh, on the 27th uh, this month. There's one in San Francisco on the 26th, and there's one in Healdsburg and on the 25th. So we really, you know, the initial event was just to be in Healdsburg, and so many people have reached out about wanting to do more events with us, and now we've expanded. We have uh, talks about one coming up in L.A., also one coming up in Nashville, uh, one in, in Chicago. So, so they're starting to, to start snowball. up here now. So if you keep an eye on the website you'll, and on the Instagram page, um, you'll see uh, events being announced a lot. So All right, so let's, we're, talk, we're, we're adding more stuff. let's talk specific for a second. In New York, it's sure. October 29th, you said? 27th. 27th. 27th yeah. October 27th. Cork Buzz, Cork Buzz Wine Cork Studio, Buzz the, in, the in Union, Union Square. Square. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And that will start when? You know, 7 o'clock, whatever? Yes, 7 p.m. Yep, that's right. And yep. when you, you, you... So if you go to the website, you can buy tickets for, for that event right now. And right. I know that we're, we're starting to sell pretty hard, so get on there quick if you if you want to get one. It's limited. And then, You're doing limited. auctioning, and then, right? We're, we're also taking wine donations because we're going to be doing a silent auction in San Francisco okay. uh, at, the, at the event at Luxem Winery. Uh, we're doing a silent auction, um, and so we're asking collectors and people who, who have wine that, that would be interested in donating it. It's a really a great way to do it. It's I'm a, donating you know, a couple of Magnums. You are, and we really appreciate yeah. it, Sam. Yeah, so I think that's a fun way to do it, and I think it's a way to really make a statement about the fact that we're wine, we're wine people helping wine people, and that's the that's the philosophy of this right. of this this movement. We we, we we want wine people to get involved to support people that, that that do the things that make our lives more you know more enjoyable, more enhanced, and 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 so th- that's the second way. And then th- there are more events coming. Um, we're, are, we are going to do another event in New York. Will be another silent auction. So right. if you're not able to get your wine in before before the deadline of of, of this San Francisco event. 
still donate, please. You can right. go to the website, it tells you how to donate. Um, Matt Tornabain, who owns a Manhattan wine company in, uh, in New York, is the guy who's receiving all of our donations right. on the East Coast. And that's and on Mike the website, Zimmer, too. Psalm Picks in, yeah, it's on the website. Mike Zima, who owns Psalm Picks in on the West Coast, is taking our, our West Coast donations. So donations are, are, are appreciated, and you know we're, we're excited to, to work with wine collectors and people who love wine to make this you know, an effort that matters. Patrick, it's a great cause, and you really got your shit together quickly on this, and I'm sure that every event will be great, and you'll wind up looking back, and you'll look at the fact that you probably did a dozen events, which would be great. So let's tell people one more time. We did justice to it, but if you really want a deep dive, go to the website. Tell everyone again. The website is wscwr.com. Dot com. And I've been on the site, and it's up and running, and everything you need to know, donating wine, where the events are, times, you know, it's philosophy, all people, yep, and all of that. So that's and, the deal with And if with you want to follow us on social media, we'll, we'll be updating new events as we have them. You know, the Where same, do they follow? Same handle, same handle at WSCWR. Uh, okay. That's, uh, that's Instagram and Twitter and everything, and, and we'll, we'll be updating events as they're coming online. And I will... Uh, you know, I'm going to post Katie's wine list stuff as I did yours, and I'll post that information, too, on my site. Awesome. All right, Patrick, you, I, want to, I want to thank you for taking, you know, time out. I know you're busy, too. Um, and I will uh, be in touch, and good luck with this, and we'll see you out there. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Katie, for letting me interrupt your, 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 uh, your interview. I appreciate it. Sure, good cause. Anytime. <laughs> All right, thanks, Patrick. You guys have a great night. All right, thanks. thanks. All right, we're going to wrap up the show. Um, if you have a question, a wine happening, or an event like Patrick was talking about, hit me up at sam at thegrapenation.com. That's sam at the Grape Nation. Follow us on Facebook at the Grape Nation. We'll post all of Katie's wine list answers, and we'll list the wine that Katie brought in on our weekly wine sip. Um, on the site, follow us on Instagram at sbenruby, Twitter at benruby. Katie, if people want to find you in all your travels, personally in restaurants, where can we find you? Yeah, well, if you want to learn more about Roman style pizza, there's at Marta Manhattan Instagram handle. Okay. There's Vini Fritti. Spell. Vini is V I N I F R I T T I. So that's the Instagram site. The restaurant, though, is V I N E, separate letter E, and then Fritte. But the Instagram is Vine Frite, I know E. Exactly. Okay. Now, what if everyone's curiosity is so peaked and they want to know more about Katie Morton? Where, do they, where can they follow you? Yeah, if you want to see uh, what's going on with me, I'm at uh, Morton Charlemagne. And is that like Corton Charlemagne? It is like Corton okay. Charlemagne. And spell uh, Charlemagne. I mean, some people know it, but spell uh, M O R T O N. Yes. Let's go ahead. C H A R. M A N G E. Magne. Yeah, yes. Charlemagne. Charlemagne. So, right. It's it's because I think Steely Dan does a song, Kid Charlemagne, and it may be spelled differently, but that doesn't matter. Um, Steely Dan is just as important as Corton Charlemagne. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so that's Vine Frite, brand new. Uh, Marta, one of the great Union Square hospitality. Incredible places to try sparkling wines, Italian wines, get some incredible food um, and incredible service and a chance to go out and meet Katie. All right, Katie, I want to thank you for coming in. Thank it, you so much, Sam. It was Sam. great. Um, you taught us a lot about a lot of things. Um, I want to thank our engineer, Vitor, and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. For listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. 
Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.